Welcome back to another episode of Hospitalis TV. Today we are born and raised in Little Italy with Laura Donadoni, also known as the Italian wine girl. That's how you're going to find her basically on all social media. How are you doing today? Very good. We are <laughs> in Little Italy, so I feel home. It's practically home base for yes, you. Yes, <laughs> yes, basically yes. Um, well, we've been talking about doing this for a while and we're both pretty busy. You're much busier than I am. I feel like you're out of the country like every uh, other week. I travel a lot. You travel, travel a, a lot. lot. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. You are a certified professional sommelier certified wine educator but mostly a certified journalist as well which mm -hmm. i'm super interested to talk to you about today um but tell us a little bit about you know for those who don't know maybe give us a brief introduction about how you got into the world of wine how you got yeah. into journalism uh, i'd love to hear that with pleasure so as you mentioned my background is journalistic so basically i was a journalist when i lived in italy and i did that for more than 15 years before moving here but I was like a, just, let's say, a regular reporter. So I was talking about politics, everyday news. Right. I was working for a TV, magazine. In, I, I, I'm from Bergamo, so I lived like 30 miles from Milan. And I was working mainly in Milan. Francia Cortaland. Francia Cortaland, so <laughs> bubbles, Perfect. Italian yes. bubbles, yes. And um, yeah, so I started out as a journalist and I always had a passion about food and wine because my family is producing a wine like as a hobby is not a wine that is on the market so I Are grew they making sparkling wines? No, or? no, in the area of Bergamo on the hills they produce like mainly Merlot and Caps okay. or let's say red wines and um, yeah so I grew up in the vineyards with my grandpa with my, my dad so I That's so cool. truly enjoyed wines since the beginning and I was also passionate about food I like cooking and so at a certain point of my career, career journalistic career I said okay Maybe it's time to stop like telling sad news and bad news every day mm. and maybe I should focus my attention on something like happier. Yeah, like wine. And like <laughs> wine, why not? So I started deepening my knowledge about wines, getting my certification, uh, sommelier certification in Italy and then I took them uh, again in the United States once I, mo once I moved. and. Uh, so I started to apply my skills, my communication skills, to the world of wine. And first as a wine reporter, so I opened my blog, my social media accounts, my YouTube channel, like spreading Italian wine culture through my media, let's say. And then I realized that uh, Italian wineries and Italian Wine Producers Association needed help to uh, communicate their wines in the U.S. market. So Italy exports a lot of wines mm -hmm. in the U.S. I think the, the, yeah, the most exported uh, wine, the most imported wines in the U.S. is Prosecco. So it's the number one mm -hmm. uh, wine in the U.S. So there is a lot to do in terms of communication around wines in the U.S. So I opened my company, which is LACOM, which is a wine agency. It's a PR and communication agency focused only on wine. So I do only work with wineries and wine producers association uh, to organize events, uh, to do wine education, uh, to build uh, communication strategies on social media, this kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's why, that's how I ended up here. Amazing. So you at one point had your own food and wine show though, right? Yeah, it's, in Italy. <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. That's like on a, on a major network, you were the host. Yeah, I was the host in Italy. What was uh, it called? It was called the Sapori Lombardi, which is uh, mm, flavors of Lombardi because I'm from Lombardia mm -hmm. uh, area. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was um, like going around uh, visiting wineries and restaurants and um, s like finding typical products, how people were producing typical products, typical cheeses, uh, salami, prosciutto and this kind of uh, goodies. And uh, it was the, the best time of my oh life my because God, I went like around it. like tasting wine and eating food and telling, uh, <laughs> like, telling this on camera, like interviewing the producers. So it was so fun. But then I have to, to left yeah. to come here with my husband because he had to move here for business. And so I started over here. Yeah. yeah. So um, you were, you've done Gambero Rosso and Vanitaly and a couple yeah. of those things. So if you don't mind, for you know, those who might not be really familiar with the Gambero Rosso mm -hmm. and what that is, maybe you know, what the, the Trebichetti and what that means yeah. for a wine or winery, could you just run us through that real quick? Yes, uh, Gambero Rosso magazine in Italy is 
our sort of wine spectator. Sure. So getting the Trebicchieri Gambero Rosso in Italy for a winery is like achieving like the 98 to 100 points on, on Wine Spectator. It's the most prestigious magazine we have that scores wine and also restaurants. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a big deal for the wineries. Uh, they submit the wines every year. They taste the wine blindly, and usually it's a team of people testing the wines, and they assign the the, the scores, yeah. uh, which is trebicchieri means three glasses. Right. So they have a like a scale of three glasses, two glasses, and if in the book in the, in right. the guide. So that's such how a, it works. Such a cutthroat yeah. system, I feel like it's almost like three Michelin stars. Yeah. Like at least like with the hundred yeah, point. And exactly. not that I'm saying that the hundred point score is better, but you know, you, you get 97, 98, 99. You know, it's a really good yeah. wine still. It just didn't get the perfect score of a hundred. Exactly. Let's see. Three star, like with the three stars, kind of got to be all or nothing. There's a, a big difference between the two and the three, I'd imagine. Yeah. Right? It's, just like it's the rest, a, yeah, the it's, it's a different. Yeah, it's, it's similar to the three Michelin star mm -hmm. or the Michelin star system, and it's different from wine spectator and wine enthusiast because it's not like. Um, reported like as a number so it's not like so precise as getting 98 96 99 it's more broaded let's right, say right. The, the the option for the wineries to get scored in a let's say more flexible way right let's put it to this way and it's a big deal and also now we have other system of scoring the wines now vinitaly international academy for instance has its own w guide which is called five stars wine I've been a judge for them in the last two years. And it's also an interesting system because there is a pool, a team of people coming from all over the world. So different palate also, international palates coming from the US, from China, mm. from uh, uh, Germany, from all over. So they are wine professionals, of course, sommelier certified or wine educator. So in different fields, yeah. there are, um, for instance, uh, people who work in the wine business as a, in the, on the trade side, so commercial, more commercial people, or more wine educators. So it's different, uh, th the approach is really different. Yeah, that's such an it's, amazing experience. Yeah, I mean, like, do you run into like, have you run into scenarios where like somebody's throwing out like a flavor profile or a fruit descriptor that you've never heard of? Yeah, it some happens all the time. Some fruit that you've never heard of? You're like, what are you it talking about? It happens all the time because That's each of cool. us has a different background, mm. a different experience of the world, of the flavors, of the smells totally. you have in your life. So sometimes, I don't know, some people from Japan says, oh, this wine smells, and they tell a name of a flower that I don't even know what it is, but <laughs> it reminds him that smell because of his uh, you know, childhood maybe. Right. So it's, it's fascinating. And uh, sometimes we have discussion in the panel uh, when judging the wines uh, about uh, acidity or tannins or uh, sens tactile sensation because each mm. of us has a different background uh, from a gastronomical point of view. So we grew up eating different foods. Mm -hmm. So we have a different scale of uh, acidity, mm. uh, alcohol, tannins, and this kind of uh, totally. descriptors. Yep. So the score that come out from that discussion and that panel is really like reliable. I mean, it's it's really multidimensional. Mm -hmm. If if you get what I mean, yep. it's not just one person scoring that wine and say, okay, mm, I taste it. 98 right. that's it right so it's a it's a com it comes down from a discussion from a, a team uh, work right oh, that's so interesting yeah that's such a good thing to have I just was having an interesting conversation with somebody the other day about you know our tasting groups and this guy had just gone to a, to another city in the mm -hmm. states even and he was blown away by just the language that they were using I oh, mean yeah. this is even within the United States yeah. like not even a different country but yeah. just going to a different city and seeing how they were approaching some of the flavor profiles that they were using it's so interesting. It it's is. so important to get that. And it's really, you know, to me, it's really like uh, reductive or I mean, it's really um, not easy to score a wine just with one number when you have such different, you know, a face of the same uh, of the same coin to, right. to evaluate in order to to tell if a wine is good or, or not. So so let's talk about that. So you've done um, some writing for the Gambero Rosso. Mm -hmm. You've judged several different competitions here in yeah. LA and San Francisco. But could you talk about maybe some of the similarities or differences between the Gambero Rosso, some of the competitions on how they're getting scored, and then something like the bigger dogs like Wine Spectator or Wine Enthusiast. 
Yeah, as, as I was mentioning before, uh, the wine competition works like in a similar way uh, like Gambero Rosso or the five star wines competition I was mentioning before, the Vin Italy international one. So for instance, the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, which I was uh, judging at the beginning of January, uh, works the same. We are a team mm -hmm. of judges coming from all the parts of the uh, United States, uh, from all over the United States. Mm -hmm. So we have people from the East Coast, people from North Carolina, people from Florida, and they try to build a team which is diverse. So you have maybe a European palette like mine, mm -hmm. and you have maybe a East Coast palette, or, and uh, so consequently like uh, East Coast and also uh, let's see, mm, so different from the West Coast Palace sure. or from another state which has different food and different uh, habits around wine. Right. And so they, they try to, uh, to give the opportunity to the, the judges to confront themselves, so to uh, share opinions and to build a score which is complete as much as complete as possible. So we, we, st we taste blindly, so this is the same for Gambero Rosso, for instance, or Vin Italy. So we just know the vintage, uh, the price point in the US. Okay. They, they tell you the price point and they don't tell you this in Italy. Uh, so, and the geographical uh, area, mm -hmm. of course. So we discuss about the wine and we assign uh, a medal so in the United States it works like a gold medal, silver medal, bronze medal, mm -hmm. which can be similar to tre bicchieri, due bicchieri, or no bicchieri, right. uh, which is very different from 198, 99, sure. etc. Because not only the score is different, but also usually in Wine Spectator and Wine Enthusiast is the, uh, the chief editor of that region that tastes the wine, uh, that ha uh, who has the last word on the wine. So for instance, for Italy, uh, I don't know, Wine Spectator has his own journalist uh, who is assigned to that part of Italy and he's always the same uh, person who tastes the wines and has the final word in saying which is the score mm -hmm. of that particular wine. Right. So I feel like there's less uh, mm, occasion to uh, confront yourself with your colleagues and so it's more like um, it's less it's, it's flexible. one person's point yeah. of view yeah. versus the average of a collective team of yeah. tasters yes very that, interesting that's the, yeah. the main difference yeah so that leads me to a very interesting point right I think if we talk about you know if we're kind of talking about wine scores and wine critics um, you know it's a very interesting conversation to be had especially compared to what's happening now with social media. Um, like you could say some of these guys were literally the original influencers, yeah. right? I mean, this guy, like take Parker, for example. Like, yes. He's the biggest example um, from a pre-internet era, mm -hmm. like direct-to-mail magazine publication that he was doing, managed to become the leading voice in how people buy and what the price of the wine was in the market. Um, I mean... God, so much around that. But what, what do you, Laura? What do you think? How did? How was that possible? How was that possible in your eyes for one person to get to have such a loud voice? Yeah, Robert Parker was the first wine influencer for sure because he started the whole thing of the scoring system. Yeah. So it comes from from him, and it's a system that was uh, that is dated today because it's it was back in the seventies. Yep. And I understand back at the time that people didn't have like instruments to decide which wine to buy because nobody was educated about wines so there there was there was a very little low uh, wine culture right. in the u.s about wine so people were starting approaching wine as an everyday uh, beverage that usually was not till like 30 years ago nobody was drinking wine every day right. or thinking about having a bottle of wine every night with with the, with the dinner so at the beginning people were kind of overwhelmed and, and confused about the amount of wine on the market and how can I decide whether this wine is good or not if I don't have any education right. about wine. So the score system like seemed to be the easiest way. So you assign a point and you, you okay, 90 point, good wine, 82 point, bad wine. Right. So it, it 
uh, they had a huge influence on the market at the beginning. So with the years, this uh, influence they had on the market uh, mm, grew a lot. Mm -hmm. And today it ends up this way. So the wine spectator or uh, wine advo advocate uh, scores refers to the mainstream wines. So you can't get a score as a wine if you're not uh, widely distributed in the United States. If, you're not, if you don't have a nationwide uh, importer, for instance, you that's don't- a, that's, a pr that's a requisite to even yes. be able to get, so if you're wine just a small guy, you can't send a letter to wine spectator mm -hmm. like, hey, please come in and, and, the, and just taste our wines and see what you think. How it works for foreign wineries, because I do that for some wineries, helping them uh, to send the samples to one spectator mm -hmm. or one enthusiast you contact the magazine the, uh, the magazine asks for some information about the wine and how it's distributed in the united states okay. and one of the requisites for wine spectator is that it uh, is widely distributed right. across the u.s right so if you are a small winery in italy with uh, ten thousand bottle producing uh, per year you're not widely distributed in right. the united states sometimes you don't even have an importer in that case uh you don't get scored right so uh, because they have to do a selection i mean they are overwhelmed by requests i mean they, they taste something like sixteen thousand wines per year that's wine insane. spectator yeah. that's th that's insane so the selection they do is okay if the wine is widely available on the market i will score it if not i won't right so what happened that people is keeping drinking the same wines mm -hmm. and the same wines are getting scored and and to get access to that system is very difficult for the wineries and for the little producers. So they, they, they basically are cut out of uh, the market even before starting. Right. Because then what happened? Importers ask uh, to the winery, oh, are your wines scored? And, and the winery says, no, they're not scored because I don't have an importer or right. a distributor. And they say, oh, I can sell your wine if you don't have a score. Oh so God. it's kind well, of a yeah. circle. It's never like any a circle, but that's where you come in, right? Uh, yeah. And it's one of the, I, I, I imagine that's one of the reasons you started the communications firm was Definitely. to be able to kind of be a spokeswoman for some of these smaller wineries that can't get a score, right? Exactly. And things are changing mm -hmm. now because if this system of the scores was working when people was not educating about wine, is educated about wines, today the millennials that are, that are driving the market today, 42% of the wine purchased in the US uh, comes from the millennials. So the, it's a millennials choice. So we are really focusing on that uh, segment of the market. Mm -hmm. People uh, with age um, till 35 years uh, age, like to, from 20 to 35 years age old uh, are driving the market now. So, and they don't, read wine spectator or right. wine enthusiast they right. don't buy these magazines for right. instance they they look up to the wine online right so so a big turning point right so it's yeah. this one guy who has this big voice and and it's driving the market but now everybody has a voice right there's a lot of noise out there there's a yeah. lot of bloggers there's a lot of people who call themselves wine specialists mm -hmm. you know wine influencers on instagram whether they really are or aren't, or whether they actually have a good foundation in wine, um, you know, how do you how do you tell apart the people that you think you should follow versus you know all the other guys without having to look into every you know different account and see what they're doing? I don't know. Or are there some people yeah. that you think are doing a really good job now? on social media I mean, as as you said you there is a lot of confusion now because if in the past um there wasn't like anybody scoring the wine so robert parker was the first and they were starting and they let's say the gps for the consumer were the scores and there were just a few of them now there is like overload of information mm -hmm. overload of occasion to understand better that kind of wine before purchasing it right. so if you want to have information about i don't know a bottle of franciacorta you want to buy that you go online and you can find a review from bloggers you can find pictures on instagram uh, made by influencers you can find information about the the winery because everybody has a website so they can give information etc you can find scores if the wine is scored or not so there is a big uh, let's say basket 
of information and, and occasion to get informed about that wine. So, and you, your question is, how do you get to choose which is the right one? Because in this confusion, or even a lot who to of, trust, right? Who yeah, to, like what voice to trust? In this confusion, let's talk about Instagram, since mm -hmm. we are both on Instagram, and I'm, I have a huge uh, Instagram account. Mm -hmm. That's my main uh, social media. Yeah, on Instagram, you can find wine influencer who doesn't know, doesn't have a clue about wine. Mm -hmm. So they are not educated, they're not the sommelier, they don't know, even know how that wine is produced, but they post pictures of wine and wineries and they say, oh, this fabulous rosé, and, and sometimes you can find also mistakes in the caption, sure. like saying, I don't know, this uh, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano uh, is from Abruzzo, and we know Vino Nobile di Montepulciano is in Tuscany, so the, the, I, kind of, uh, this kind of stuff. Right, right. So how a uh, consumer can detect if this person is to be trusted or not, you need to educate yourself. Unfortunately, in this like overload of information, you yourself, consumer, need to do some digging and to you know inform yourself about the wine world and then you can decide which critic you want to trust mm -hmm. and which of them is more reliable and which which of them is just an influencer because it's paid by wineries to stick a picture of 100%. that winery on, right. on their profile. Which we know is happening a lot. Yeah. Yes. So the, the, the let's say the, the line between advertising and informing mm -hmm. is very, very thin right. now. So right. that's the problem of, of the communication, uh, the wine communication today. Right. So that's great. So now let's look at what would be some advice that you'd have if you could maybe share a couple of secrets of some mm -hmm. of the stuff that you do. Like what are some of the best techniques or best practices for a small wine brand mm -hmm. or a small winery that's trying to come out? Let's give them the benefit of the doubt that they have a good product because mm -hmm. obviously the product has yeah. to be good if nobody cares. If it's a horrible wine, yeah. just forget about it. It's going to yeah. be a tough sell. Let's say you make a good product and they want to <clears throat> stand out in the sea of influencers and information that's out there what do you recommend for a small brand how do they succeed now these days i would recommend them to make like and they can't go to wine spectator like you're saying they're not yeah. widely produced throughout the whole country or, or widely distributed excuse me how do these guys win yeah the, i mean social media is a big occasion for them so um in this area also this small producer they have uh, the opportunity to have a say in mm -hmm. the market because there are these social media and bloggers which are independent and they, they work uh, like um, independently and even if you don't have access to one spectator or one enthusiast, you can have some visibility online, mm -hmm. which is something that is really important today since millennials, they look online before purchasing wine. So, right. so I suggest them to narrow the choice uh, to maybe five, five to 10 bloggers, uh, like uh, focusing on uh, the engagement these blogs or uh, social media accounts have uh, online. What are a couple of your favorites? Uh, in the US? Yeah. You mean, oh, there are there Like are for a few. bloggers? That bloggers, oh, uh -huh. one of my favorite is the fermented fruit. Okay, the fermented which is fruit. Ryan, uh, a friend of mine, he lives in uh, Washington DC, I believe. And he, I like him because he's very knowledgeable about wines, mm -hmm. but he's a consumer. I mean, he's not uh, a wine educator, he's not uh, like working in the wine business. He had a totally different background, but he informed himself, uh, educate himself a lot okay. about wines before starting writing. Mm -hmm. And he write very accurate description of wine. What you have to look at is that if this blogger or influencer knows his or her stuff. So you look at the caption, you look at the articles they publish, and you see how accurate they are, how the descriptor are. So you, as a wine producer, you know if you try to reach out to this person, your wine will be for sure evaluated in a, let's say, right and fair way, mm -hmm. instead of just like being like posted with a, maybe a wrong caption and miscommunication. So right. first, cho choose 
the persons and the bloggers and the influencer and then uh, you can have an agency or you can do it yourself you mm -hmm. can reach out to them and try to understand if they will be interested in tasting your wines mm -hmm. or trying to invite them to some of your tastings or send them information about the wine so they probably receive a lot of requests but if it, they are really curious about wine and if they really they are really focusing about educating and informing about wines they will at least look at them and, and they will at least like consider them. Yeah. So not just for money, but for curiosity. So Laura, what would be some, maybe some best practices that you would like to see in some of these emerging wine influencers? I would like to see like more informed people. So I would like to, the wine influencer to be like more informative than let's say, focusing only on the aesthetic point of view, like posting a beautiful picture, mm -hmm. but with a, meaningless caption for instance mm -hmm. so in that way you're not informing you're just like showing a beautiful bottle of wine and saying yay i love it so it doesn't add anything to you know to the people who is following you right so i would like to see like more authentic people more real profile uh, there are a lot of uh, profile also that repost pictures mm -hmm. of other profile and this is something i don't understand because you know i have a journalistic background so I, uh, everything i post uh, is because I've seen it with my eyes. Mm -hmm. I took a picture and I share it with people or I tasted and I share with people. So it's, com it's coming out from my real experience to the social media, to the people. So that's for me what a social media uh, community needs to be like. Right. But I see a lot of, you know, marketing uh, profile, like just reposting beautiful picture and dreaming places and wineries and, and fancy situation, which are fake. But I don't know. I know they have a lot of followers, mm -hmm. but I, I would say if you want to be an, an influencer, don't focus on followers, focus on the engagement. So focus on how many authentic comments you have under your pictures, mm -hmm. how many people like contact you asking more about what you posted. Right. So even if they are a few, they're real, they are authentic. So that's, you, you made a, uh, a change in, in the life of that person, right. which maybe now is tasting a new wine and is daring to drink something different right. because they read it on your profile so that that's your job right i love it yeah absolutely and that's what we're doing every day <laughs> yeah, we're trying right? to get people to try new yeah. different things and give them an educated call if they like something steer them in a different direction that they might you know something that they might be happy with so yeah. that's what brings me the most joy here on a daily basis exactly. is being able to do that so yeah. i think social media should be that platform to be able to do it on a larger scale right, right. this curiosity about life about wine mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. yeah our fuel yes so I know you have to get out of here. Uh, I want to finish up with something though. I've been seeing you've been writing in a gratitude journal yes. on your IG stories. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it's one of the practices I do. I have a self-love practice, mm -hmm. uh, how people now call them just to look fancy, but it's kind of <laughs> like, uh, if to me it's a way to pray. I mean, I'm Catholic, I have a uh, faith in God and be grateful every day is part of my daily prayers. So keeping track of what I'm grateful for every day and it involves wines all the time because maybe <laughs> I had a, you know, a new uh, glass, a new wine and it was amazing and I didn't even know it existed. So I, I discovered a new grape or this kind of stuff always is in my gratitude journal mm -hmm. because you know, life is a, a discovery every day and even the small things that makes you smile for a while are worthy to be remembered. So that's I love why that. I, keep a I love that. Yeah. Me the mental, the mental game is such a big part of everything that it we is. do. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you yeah. so much for your time. I appreciate you taking the time thank to do this. Thank you for the opportunity. It was a lovely chat. Oh, it's a pleasure. And guys, once again, you can find Laura online at the Italian wine girl. Exactly on youtube make sure you go there on instagram yeah. you got to follow her she's super active she posts a lot of things on her instagram stories almost every day you can follow her travels all throughout italy um, i yeah. highly recommend you do that last but not least do not forget to follow hospitala tv we're on Definitely. facebook youtube please follow us we're now on itunes podcast we're on spotify just look up hospitala tv uh, and give us a follow tell us what you think thank you so much thank you